Good evening and welcome to the Strategy Session. I'm your host tonight, Rick Wilson. We are joined, as always, by Joe Trippi and Stuart Stevens. And tonight, also joining us, is my brilliant friend, Jen Maricia. She is the author of Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. So tonight, we're going to talk a little bit with Jennifer about all the culture war trickery that goes on inside Trump world and in that in that space of of the complex and subtle um, things that look like they're crude, but really are very clever uh, in terms of manipulating the Republican audiences uh, to support Trump. So we're going to start right out. um, And and I want to say we will talk about the culture war tonight. We will talk about the, um, the, the fatwa that Trump world has issued against Taylor Swift because they have basically made themselves into the mullahs of America. It is a war that I could not be happier they are waging. Could not be any <laughs> happier if I tried at this war they are waging. It is the most amazing. It is the most amazing example of. And Jen in the audience, I hope you all pardon me for being a little bit of crude, but sticking their dick in a toaster oven. This is not working out like they thought. Um, so <laughs> meanwhile. To launch the show, Jen, welcome to the strategy <laughs> session. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the evolution of MAGA rhetoric right now and how he's trying to talk to his audience and hold on to them. Well, he's absolutely doing a lot of the same tricks that he's always done, right? Which is us, them, polarization, um, forcing loyalty. You're with us or you're against us. The stuff he's been doing the last few weeks with Nikki Haley has been uh, par for the course, but also interesting. Um, you know, I really see him, and I know I've written about this, and so probably folks have seen it, but I really see him as just a massive loser right now. And I see um, him using rhetorical strategies that sort of show us that he knows he's a loser, right? So going for, um, you know, I'll be a dictator on day one, right. using Hitler-esque Um, you know, allusions to poisoning our blood and things like that. Um, To me, that shows a lot of weakness, uh, right? Because it's a faux show of strength. And um, I think it's just him recognizing what a bad position he's in. You know, he's lost the popular vote in 2016 and 2020. He lost, you know, as head of the party, he lost the election in 2018. He lost in 2020. He lost in 2022. He's losing in court. Uh, You know, the guy is just a huge loser. He is the most unpopular person to ever run for president in American history. His popularity level was never 47% or higher. He is not more popular now than he was then. Uh, And I think that what I see every day from Donald Trump is that he is weak and he knows that he's weak. And so he's, you know, using this dictator strategy to try to cover that over. Stu, what do you think about that? Um, I just want to listen to Jennifer. Um, So, uh, (laughs) you know, um, you know what I've been thinking about lately, because I've been uh, I just read this incredible novel um, called Cold Victory, which is uh, set in. Finland right after World War II involving a bunch of Russians and the demand that the totalitarian state places upon you to lie, how you cannot tell the truth and how many Republicans are now living in that totalitarian state where mm-hmm. they, are, they, they whisper things at night the way they did, you know, they do still in, in Russia, the way they do in North Korea, things that you can't say. They're worried about... Uh, their own best friends uh, uh, informing on them. And they have to go out and say this stuff that they know is absolutely not true. Um, and it's, I, 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 look at Tim Scott. I mean, look look at how Tim Scott standing up there just being humiliated by Trump. And there is some tremendous irony that the party that we like to think anyway was the most consistent foe to the Soviet Union and totalitarianism that is most conservative wing now, which is pretty much 70% of the party, if not more, has uh, created a universe that they now are living in uh, their, what they thought that they were opposing. And I really want to hear from, from, from Jennifer how she thinks this is going to play out. Like, what, 
what she sees as the post-Trump era, if we can even imagine that. But we can do that later. <laughs> so, Joe, I mean, you've talked a lot about framing Trump as a loser lately and on the economy, particularly on foreign policy and everything else. I mean, Jen's point of use, he's using all these rhetorical tricks. Uh, how well do you think they're going to hold up in the face of like ground truths like the economy, the border, uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, and all these other areas where, where Biden has been a pretty strong leader in comparison to Trump being a strong talker? Yeah, well, I, I've said, I mean, I, all along, I, I've i believed that the pundits and the, you know, c- cable all is treating him like he's, you know, they are misjudging how weak he really is. Um, and I've said, and we, we, I think we're seeing it in, in these early state results. I mean, the guy who's supposed to be God in his party rules it with an iron fist. Everybody must obey. He got 50 per, 51% in Iowa. I mean, if 49% of the Iowa caucus said no, even in New Hampshire, right. where, yeah, he got 55. I mean, so, you know, 45 went the other way. Even in South Carolina, where he's going to run away with it, according to everybody, and maybe he will, but the, the he was at 53%. I mean, there, what I'm trying to say is it's – I'm agreeing with Jen. Uh, and I think he knows how weak he is. Um, uh, and so he – but the question I have for Jen is – because I just can't get my head wrapped around the holy war on Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, can you – how does that – I mean – how the how does that work into his his plans here? I mean, how does that how does that strong weak thing play when he's taking on you know Taylor? Is it because he's taking her on that makes him strong? I mean, what is it that makes this make any sense at all? Yeah, so make it makes sense, Jen. Make it make sense. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best. So one of the things that I've really learned a lot about in the last few years is the research in political science and political psychology about right-wing authoritarian personalities. And probably y'all have read this stuff too. Um, but it, and this is research that dates back to um, the end of the second war. Um, you know, people have been studying this for a really long time. And even as early as 2016, scholars had found that a majority of Trump supporters tested highly on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. Um, and you can take a quiz online about that if you are curious what your own authoritarian tendencies are. Um, but the thing about right-wing authoritarians is they look to and they look for what's known as a socially dominant personality. Um, these are people who are narcissists, you know, subclinical Machiavellianism, sadism, you know, the really nasty um, <laughs> combination of, of people factors. Um, and those people want to dominate. And so these right wing authoritarians look for someone to be a strong leader. Right. And so they're looking for signals that um, prove that Donald Trump is strong. Right. And so this is why he's always critiquing Biden for being old and weak and a loser, because for Trump's base, like the diehard, you know, core of his base, they want a strong leader. Right. They mm-hmm. want a dictator. They want a Hitler type person because they think that everything is chaos, that, um, you know, the natural hierarchy is being defiled, that the nation is being ruined, and they are looking for someone to save them and the nation. And so Donald Trump has always been able to convince those folks that he's their guy, right? As much as, you know, all of us <laughs> might look at him and be like, no, he's definitely not your guy. <laughs> they and they have always believed, right, that he is that guy. And so he's constantly putting up that bravado, that face, you know, of being a dictator and a strong leader. Um, he won't ever admit that he has failed or that he's weak in any way. So the strategy for a dictator, wannabe, strong leader, you know, Hitler type person is uh, to do what Stuart said, right, which is to... Uh, make people conform, bend them to your will through long knifing them, right? That's what Hitler did. 
Um, so that those around you don't try to challenge your authority. Uh, scholars call this coup proofing. You can look it up on Google Scholar. Uh, there's a whole bunch of coup proofing, proofing strategies that are uh, well, well researched. Uh, long knifing is one of them. And um, they also, of course, create hate objects, right? So these are scapegoats that we can point to. They tend to be the weakest among the population, right? Um, so it might be people like, I don't know, school teachers teaching, you know, um, CRT, or it might be transgender people needing to use the restroom or whatever. Um, and they point to them and they say that, you know, immigrants, whoever, these people are the reason why your life, you know, isn't what you want it to be. And we can blame them for everything. And so what I think they're doing, and this is so dumb, is that they're trying to turn Taylor Swift into a hate object so they can use her as a scapegoat. But this, and Rick can tell you why, they, this is the dumbest idea that they've had in quite some time. Uh, because Taylor Swift is nobody's hate object. In a catalog of <laughs> dumb damn ideas, this is right up there, pen to end. She and her followers are not the kind of people who are willing to be turned into hate objects. Um, you probably saw on Twitter this week that there were some AI generated photos of Taylor. You probably maybe even didn't see them because her legions of fans swamped Twitter um, with all kinds of positive Taylor Swift um, memes and images and videos, and they all said, protect Twi Taylor, right? Um, this is not going to turn out like they want it to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe and, and Stuart, I have a quick question for you. Have you guys, in, in all your experience, I can't really think of a, a, of a culture fight like this, except maybe Springsteen a couple times, where where Republicans misread a cultural moment so profoundly. They're usually good at the spectacle of capturing something that can outrage their people against a target that doesn't fight back. Uh, have you guys ever seen anything even remotely like this? Because I'm, I'm, no, I'm struggling Rick, to get to something. Rick, they're so good at it that it's got me scratching my head. What am I not seeing? What <laughs> am I missing about this? <laughs> you know? It's just like... Because this is I just can't. so bad. I, you know, I, I think that they've been they've been on a losing streak for a while. So think about it. Yep. They, at one point, they took on Coca Cola. Remember that? Yeah, mean, that worked Coke? out well. Yeah, but Coke? really, you're going to take on Coca Cola. <laughs> then they took on um, Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick, Nike made nine billion dollars. Then they took on NASCAR because NASCAR banned the Confederate flag. So you're in a culture war as a Republican with NASCAR? I remember they even got in a culture war with Walmart for a while when Walmart had mask mandates. So you're like, you're in the wrong side of culture war with yeah. Walmart and NASCAR and pro football? Um, you're going out it, well. It, it's, it's to me, I really like to just say, it's part of this fear of the contemporary world. That yes. a fear of not only the future, but the world that they live in, that they are uncomfortable in this moment. And the mm -hmm. moment only is going to accelerate um, the context of it all being we're headed to a minority majority country and all the Stephen Millers in the world aren't going to stop that. Right. Um, and instead of embracing that, which any sort of sane party would try to do. Um, you know, Haley Barber, one of my old clients, used to say, mm. beef the future, it's going to happen anyway. And they're, they're fighting it. And it, it's, it's very much like Putin. And, and these other, you know, there are no gay people in Russia, as we know. Sure, uh, yeah. There, there are no women in power in Russia. <laughs> um, it's just a mythical world. They're all good Christians, even though, you know, Huge percentage of the country is Muslim, and if anybody thinks Putin's a Christian, um, and it's it's a it must be a terrible feeling to wake yeah. up and you're assaulted by all this stuff that you think is attacking you, instead of being able to just embrace it and enjoy it. And you can't even watch a football game without it being some sort of 
test or it's it's just I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they don't seem very you know, happy. I mean, I mean, it, it's tough because you have Peyton Manning throwing out Bud Light to you know it, it, during the commercials. I mean, it, it, it you know, a football. Oh, yeah, game. Right. I mean, they must just feel assaulted like, at every moment. You know? Yeah, <laughs> you know, when Rick and I joined the Republican Party, we fought like you know the Soviet Union. Yeah. Now, now it's Bud Light. Right I mean, now, 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 now the beer. object of but you now, know now the Twilight struggle is against a beer <laughs> company. A, a, but, and it's not just but, Bud Light; it's a beer label. Right? Yeah. It's, it's like really that's that's what this has come down. We were thinking that, more. That's like, where you're gonna. That's where you're you gonna. Know, like, that's maybe, where you're gonna die on. Maybe like the Gulag. But, Let's take but that Jen, on, You know. But Jen, um, you, like you said that they they're you know they want to create hate objects, you know, transgender, you know, they, they pick on the weakest. Yeah. How, I mean, that's when, how do you make the miscalculation that you could turn, you, you, tra, you know, I mean, it, <laughs> Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, you know, t turn, somehow turn, first of all, I don't know, I, I, everybody I know, all the women and girls that I know in my family, Daughters, you know, daughter, and they all love her, right? I mean, I just don't mm -hmm. don't get the mis how you could n not see this going down, going wrong. Uh, can yeah. they get that that tunnel, that kind of tunnel vision where they there's they? I mean, I don't know if you can explain how yeah. that. Yeah, I, I can it's, try. I can try. It's a really good question. Yeah, so I can try. So. It's, uh, it's really interesting for me when I was doing research on my book about the 2016 election, I was reading a lot of the Daily Stormer website, which is um, an alt-right neo-Nazi oh, sure. website. Yeah. And they always use pictures of Taylor Swift as their ideal woman, right? So young even pictures of her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it was always, this is what a woman should be. And it would be Taylor Swift, you know, just looking at in a photo or whatever. Um, and she turned on them, right? She didn't want to be their ideal woman. Um, she didn't like them, <laughs> right? She, 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 she's not a neo-Nazi, even though the, she's their ideal. Um, and as I've learned more about how fascism works, um, fascism is absolutely for losers. Stuart, you're so right on. Um, it's people who look at what is happening and they realize that they've lost the future and that they've already lost it and that they're trying to do whatever they can to reclaim it. Um, and it's primarily about violence and hierarchy. Those are like the two essential qualities of fascism. Um, it's inherently violent as a, a, a way of life. It believes, you know, with Mussolini that violence makes you manly and virile, you know, as a person and as a nation. Um, they don't believe in peace. They believe in a cult of death. Um, there's no, uh, there's no like emphasis put on protecting life in a fascist regime. Um, at the same time, it's very much loyalty and hierarchy, particularly men over women, um, right? Because the men are the virile fighters and, uh, fascism is so much about violence. And so, um, you know, I think that part of the miscalculation here is that they are so isolated in their own fascist communication network where those are accepted major premises mm -hmm. that everything else follows quite easily for them, right? So if we should be violent and we should be masculine and we should, you know, adhere to norms of masculinist violence, then someone like Taylor Swift, who, you know, like sequins, uh, who <laughs> controls, uh, you know, the women of the world um, and who is absolutely everywhere because she makes so much money and she's so popular and everyone's listening to her music and she's the person of the year. And now she has invaded this masculine space of violence that we, you know, thought was our safe space every Sunday. Um, and she has already rejected us, right? We hate her <laughs> with, with a, a, a vengeance. Um, just because she exists and because she has not succumbed to the fascism, right? The fascist norms. Um, she has rejected them over and over again. Um, and then, of course, 
she's really into the girl power and into um, telling your own story um, and issues of equality and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I think that in, in their fascist communication environment, it makes perfect sense, but it just shows that they don't live in reality, right? That the rest of us live in a happier place where Taylor Swift is great. <laughs> so Kit, let me ask you a question. You know, I was really struck by this number that, um, showed up in the Des Moines Register polling that Ann Seltzer was doing, that I think the number was 68% of self-identifying Republicans in Iowa are now men. 68%. Um, so, I mean, how much of this is way predominantly skewed to men and how much of it still is affecting women that, you know, the out there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's I've seen, question. it's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer. I've seen some contradictory polling, um, about support for the Republican Party and support for, you know, these different, like, um, anti-trans legislation, things like that, um, that have actually confused me. So I looked at one poll where there was more support among older conservative men um, for trans equality, for example, um, or women's rights, for another example, than there were among younger conservative men or women that were either younger or older. And so there was more empathy uh, <laughs> in the older male conservative population mm -hmm. um, and more a, a more like liberal take on the gender issue than I would have expected. Um, and that really surprised me. So I've seen some things. Um, I certainly have seen polling like you're you're um, talking about, but I don't know how to explain it all. I mean, I certainly know that the appeals for fascism um, are veil very male centric, right? Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, the lady fash, right? That's not a, no, a non. They're, they're real. They're yeah. real. They're never going to be the men in the arena that you know they want to be, but that's because in a fascist world they're going to get put it back in the house. <laughs> um, but, you know, they're useful. They're useful idiots for the fascist regime. You know, Jen, I really appreciate your time tonight. We should have you back more often because basically we let you talk and we look smarter. So <laughs> oh, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. We really appreciate you. Uh, and But you know what? Stick around. Actually, stick around. We're going to take some audience questions. And, you know, Therese, you're exactly right. Let's take some audience questions. And, uh, and oh, actually... Before we take audience questions, I want to show you one thing. Uh, I think it's queued up. Sam, let's pump the God ad. President Trump will have a miracle second term. He is the one that God's going to put his hands on. God says, I'm going to flip this thing, and we haven't seen anything yet, but it's coming. We're not crazy. They're crazy. And justice will be served, says your God. This is far from being over. And nothing will stop me from my plan at putting my son, Donald Trump, back in that White House. All of this is culminating in Donald Trump getting his second term of presence. It has to. I hear the sound of victory. I hear the sound of victory. Make America great again. That's what the Bible says. That is spiritual warfare. We'll take it by force. This is war. Let me tell you something. You ain't seen an insurrection yet. Uh. So tell us a little bit. Give us like your top line summary of how that, watching that particular set of clips, where what's their rhetorical framing? What's their mental framing about this right now um, when it comes down to to Trump as a religious and, and propaganda object for them. Yeah. So uh, you might have heard me talk before about amygdala hijacking. Um, yes. And that is where your, um, your natural fight or flight response is activated in your brain. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes over. So your amygdala floods your body with stress hormones, cortisol, right. whatever. It makes it very hard to think critically. Um, and what I saw in that ad is a 
a bunch of appeals designed to hijack your amygdala. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I mentioned before about right wing authoritarianism. A lot of the research on right wing authoritarianism, authoritarianism is also looking at people with high religiosity. And yep. it's not, you know, exactly the same thing, but there is a strong co-occurrence um, of people with right wing authoritarianism as a personality and high religiosity because they pair well together. Right. So people who are interested in stability, in hierarchy, in following a strong leader, living by a kind of communal code that they're very defensive of, those mm-hmm. folks tend to be highly religious. Um, and so, uh, and I think particularly the kinds of churches that we just saw there. Um, and so, yeah, so what I see there uh, worries me for those people who belong to those churches because they're not allowed to think critically right? Their amygdala is being hijacked. They have a vulnerability. Um, We all have vulnerabilities. And those folks trust their ministers and their religious leaders to tell them, you know, and guide them to, you know, a correct spiritual path. Um, And here they're being taken advantage of. Fascinating. Fascinating. Why? Is that why you know, when we say evangelicals support Trump, it always drives me crazy because white evangelicals support Trump. Black evangelicals oppose him in greater numbers than white evangelicals support him. Um, I mean, Joe uh, saved the state of Alabama from electing, a, you know, accused child molester because of black evangelicals, a lot of women. Is it that the leaders are delivering a different message? Is that why there's such a divide so it's not it's not the evangelical, or is it, or is there something different about white evangelicals in their sort of anger? Yeah, I wish I I wish I knew better. I wish I have studied um, the black evangelical church and the white evangelical church, but I haven't done that. Interesting, interesting. Scholars yeah. probably have other ones. <laughs> But I would think that it's probably, I, I think your, your guess is probably correct. Um, I would guess that their religious leaders, um, you know, which tend to frame things in more of a Jeremiatic tradition, um, mm-hmm. you know, talking about what our obligations are, what's lost and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I think that they probably phrase it in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right, uh, let's get a couple audience questions here before we uh, close out the half hour tonight. You're the head of the Biden reelect. What's your next move? Joe Trippy, take it away. Keep on the contrast. Uh, do exactly what they've been doing. Uh, they started to hit that uh, last few weeks, maybe a month ago. Uh, and I think it, it will contrast even better now that Trump is out there and they're doing crazy things like launching a holy war on Taylor Swift. I mean, it, that contrast, um, I think, is what what between, you know, Trump's hold uh, an authoritarian movement mm-hmm. in MAGA and and Biden's calmness in 2016 and the, the, you know, the old boring guy um, that, that no one thought had a chance uh, that it, when he announced that would be his best day. That contrast, though, I think has served the pro-democracy side of things really well, 2020, 2018, you know, all the way through here, uh, 2022 for sure. And I think uh, they've hit it. They've hit the their stride. And uh, and I think Trump's just starting to hit his. Stu? Um, look, um, you know, I, I, I think Biden's going to win this and win it pretty Easily, surprisingly easily. Um, it, to me, there's sort of two things that they need to do. They need to make Biden the safer choice so that um, he, he is less risky than voting for Trump. And I think that they need to make Biden represent the future. Um, and they have to not allow Trump to run as a challenger but as a failed president. So this whole border mm-hmm. discussion, the only reason that there is a border crisis now is because Trump, who was this, the guy that made it more of an issue than any other presidential campaign 
you know, ever, um, failed, even when he controlled Congress. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, and that's part of what I think we have to do with the Lincoln Project is keep bringing people back to that. Um, because, you know, Trump is never comfortable defending, which is why I don't think he's as good a candidate in 20. He had to defend a record and he didn't even know what his record was. Um, yeah. And I look, I, I think the Biden people are very good. I think they're going you know, to I it. think, yeah. I, mean, I, I think they got to take it to, we, you know, we've talked about this, you know, they, they, they have to take it straight to them in the wall. Turns out the wall was weaker than the president who promised to build it. I mean, yeah. it's just really pull, run at his weakness, loser. Um, and, and he'll, he'll lash out like, you know, like nothing and it could create holy wars all over the place. That's the contrast. Jen, I know you, you know, you're not, you're not expected to be one of the, uh, jaded political hacks on the call today, but um, what would you do rhetorically and communications wise if you were the Biden campaign? Well, I do teach political communication, fellas. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I, in any other context. So. <laughs> so I agree with Joe about contrast ads, um, right? Voters learn more from contrast ads than they do from anything else. Um, yep. They love to see the side by side, I think it does work to Biden's advantage and it provides an opportunity for Biden to tell his story in a way that sets him apart from Trump. Um, I also have enjoyed that Biden has um, started to use the loser language to talk about Trump. Um, and I've enjoyed that personally. <laughs> and, and for him, um, I've seen those get recirculated quite a bit. Um, and so I think that the voters like that, you know, most people are tuned out of politics. So, you know, mm -hmm. we, the folks on this call, we're, we're right. unusual <laughs> in how much we pay attention. And so most people aren't paying attention. They don't really know what Biden has done. I think those contrast ads would be very helpful for making that. And I think Stuart's totally correct that um, Biden is seen as the safer option between the two of them. Um, I was really impressed with the voters from Iowa and New Hampshire that were voting for Nikki Haley and said that they absolutely would never vote for Donald Trump, um, that there yeah. was nothing that Trump could do, right. that he had right. lost their vote a long time ago. Um, and uh, I think that that's probably true for a lot of people in this country. I mean, that's just so unusual. I mean, you know, we, we've all sat in these rooms trying to put together these numbers and You've got to get 90 plus percent of your own party to be in the game. Yeah. I mean, that's not enough. But if you're, if you're not there, you don't have a chance. Um, and to have people who are so self-selecting that they'll go out and risk death voting at night in Iowa at minus 20, <laughs> they're still not going to support the other person. Right. <laughs> that is like... <laughs> If I was God help us, you know, working Trump, Trump inspires scared, voters to that vote would against scare them. the hell out of <laughs> Dark or light, yes. And I, I don't really think attacking Nikki Haley's dress turned it around. Yeah, no, it didn't, it didn't really work out that well. Okay, let's do another, uh, another audience question. Best message to put pressure on the House GOP to fund the Ukraine defense. Maggie from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I'll start with you, Stuart Stevens. I know this is an issue that you are very knowledgeable of. Um, you know, I've I've thought that one of the keys here is to um, tell the story in a World War II context. Um, mm -hmm. More Ukrainians died fighting the Nazis um, than Americans. We lumped them together by saying the Soviet Union, but the number of actual Ukrainians that died was disproportionate of the uh, Red mm -hmm. Army troops, and. Uh, if there's one unifying good war in American psyche, it is World War right. II. And there are um, every every town uh, has has a World War II hero. Um, sure. There's a bridge for him. Um, you know, if I ran the world, I would have Ukrainians coming over and going around to conservative areas and talking at Rotary clubs and VFW sure. halls. And just telling their story of, of that they are fighting the same war that we thought that we had won in 1945. And it has continued. Um, 
and I think that, that that's a very, very powerful message. Um, and it is just so extraordinary that Republicans are now the Putin party. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah. blows my mind. It's, it, it really is dark. How about, how about you, Joe? Uh, I, I agree with all that, but I also think that um, just like with the border, this is, look, there's bipartisan support and American support for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's Trump right. and a few, the MAGA minority in the House that are sabotaging, uh, you know, t take um, the way uh, Stewart, you, you know, posed it, but add that to it to make sure, it, it, because I think that's, that's the rest of the campaign here is that on the border, on Ukraine, you know, and all these issues of chaos and things that you're worried about, right. there is uh, you, you know, Biden and there are people in Washington who will do it. But guess who's standing in the way? And it's not just the, Repu you know, I, I think even I make the mistake of saying, you know, the Republicans in Congress, but it's it's a minority led by Donald Trump that sure. has put, you know, that it's going to that is that is going to end democracy in Ukraine, give Putin a victory, put Europe on and, and lead us in that. You want to avoid World War Three? Yeah, um, this yeah. guy wants to take us straight into one by letting Putin go on the march, uh, I think, which we, and bring the World War II story in first, like, like Stuart said. I like it. Well, folks, we are getting up on our time tonight. We have got another event to do in a few minutes. Sadly, this one is not open to the public, but it has been a great day for America. They declared war on Taylor Swift. Okay, we've got some podcasts here at Resolute Square. The Enemies List, that's me, that trippy show with Joe Trippy. Decoding Fox News with Julie Jeske, The Zero Line with Sarah Ashton Cirillo. These are all really smart folks, myself included, I guess, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm at least amusing. I dance monkey dance twice a week on the pod. We are looking forward to seeing you guys again next week at this time where we will have more festivities. By the time next week rolls around, I predict that Donald Trump will have declared war on Vatican City, um, <laughs> and demanded that, we, um, that, 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 that the country... Um, each place a photograph of him in their home, like Kim Jong-un, and other festivities <laughs> in the culture where you don't want to miss. Thanks, everybody. We will see you again next time. Thank you, Jen. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, so everybody, great everybody to chat with you. everything Jen Thanks. writes. She's <laughs> so good. Absolutely. So good. Absolutely.